constructs current bets on B disease and cures. So give it up for Tracy.
that is very famous for cloning the first animal. You guys remember? Dolly. Now, now this wasn't Dolly, okay, because Dolly's like, I think, you know, no longer with us, but this might have been one of Dolly's colleagues. So we had to like walk through the sheep field, right, uh, to get to their apiary. And these are actually what are called Scottish hives. They have kind of an interesting top to them. And this was, uh, this was actually January when I visited there, so it was you know, winter for them. Um, but they had these straps, these keeping, they weren't moving these hives anywhere, they were just staying there. How did they have those? There's no bears in Scotland, by the way. No <laughs> wind. Nope, not wind. What's that? Yeah, you know, that's, that's kind of what I thought. I kind of thought, you know, because I was like, you know, I didn't want to ask a dumb question. I was like, I don't think there's any bears in Scotland. And, you know, and, and I kind of said, you know, you know, he's like, oh, no. You know, and I, I can't do a good Scottish accent, but he was like, there's no bears in Scotland, but there's other beekeepers. This was actually their place. Yeah. Yeah. So you learn all kinds of interesting things when you go all over and get different perspectives, and that's kind of what I enjoy. So, anyhow, um, I wrote an article, there's going to be an article coming out on hive beetles in bee culture, I think, in January, February. So I adopted this, this talk, really, from that, that article. If you guys are really interested, if anybody's really interested, I have a couple handouts on hive beetles as well. So I'm talking about, by the way, small hive beetles. There are large hive beetles as well, but what we're going to focus on is small hive beetles, and these are the ones that really are of at least immediate concern for us. And the scientific name is Athena timidia. And I always like to look up like where this name comes from. And we actually have an entomologist at Grove City, and I was like, as I looked it up, and timidia is actually pretty easy to figure out. It actually comes from tumor, which means swelling, right? But Athena, I looked up Athena, and it literally meant like Athena, like the goddess Athena. And I was like, that can't be right, it can't be right, it can't be right. And I, I, kind of asked the, the entomologist, I'm like, is, is it Athena? What does this mean? And he looked it up a little bit. He was like, yeah, I kind of think that's where it comes from. And when I, we studied a little bit more on Greek mythology, apparently Athena, according to Greek mythology, was born fully armored, fully as an adult. She sprung forth from Zeus's skull. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. But she, um, so I guess maybe if this means we're still looking into this. If any, if there's any, uh, you know, Latin and Greek scholars out there, let me know if this is, a, is is off. But we think that's where it came from. But it's you have these hive beetles, and and they're kind of evasive. And then when they get bad, they literally fully armored spring forth from your hive and can really take things over. So perhaps. That's where this genus name came. So the problem is, is this is often considered to be a secondary pest, right? I mean, if you guys have seen hive beetles, and I've, I've talked to beekeepers, they're like, ah, it's just a hive beetle. But maybe, maybe it's just a secondary pest. Certainly it's not American Falbury, but it certainly can cause issues in your hive. Uh, it, they're native to South Africa, so and they were imported here like many other pests and diseases. Uh, it was reported here as early as 1996, if you look in the literature. So it's a relatively new pest, but it's now endemic in the US. What's endemic mean for the day? Endemic. Everybody knows what epidemic and pandemic means nowadays, but what's endemic mean? It's widespread. Yeah, it's widespread. It's here, right? You're going to have low levels of it. It's here. There's no stopping the spread. It's, it's, it's just kind of here in a low level. You got it. We got it. And it's actually endemic in much of the world. In Europe, the way they handle diseases, bee diseases, and many other uh, animal diseases, is they call them notifiable. United States, we oftentimes use the word portable. 
Uh, but in Europe, hive beetles are considered to be a reportable parasitic disease. So if you have this in your hives, you're supposed to let the authorities know. So let's talk a little bit about the life cycle. Essentially, we have adults. Adults will mate, females will lay eggs, and they will be in the hive. The eggs will hatch out into larvae. They will be in the hive. The larvae will then go out of the hive and pupate in the soil, usually in front of the hive or near the hive area. We'll talk about this in a little bit more detail as we go through. And then the pupa emerge as adults in the life cycle starts over again. This whole process under ideal temperature conditions takes about four to six weeks to happen. So you know, every month or so, you can get this as a repeating cycle if it's warm enough. Now, one thing to know about the life cycle, why would need to target this so much is because that's usually whenever we can make an intervention to try to control these pests. So they pupate in the soil near the hive. Mm. That's when they're out of the hive. So that's a key target that we oftentimes can focus on to maybe reduce or eliminate these beetles, at least near our hives. A few other kind of sad facts to know about small hive beetles is that females can live up to six months. So uh, she will overwinter in your hive. She'd be pretty happy to do so. Let her. And in her lifetime can lay about a thousand eggs. The adults can also fly, so if they pupate in front of your hive, they can crawl on back into your hive, but they can also go for miles around maybe up to five miles of what the literature says. Probably more like three, but you know, five <coughs> miles is kind of the spread. What I will say to you though is that while yes, you can spread, if you have high beetles, they can spread around that location. Trucks and boats are faster. So whenever we're transporting hives all around the world, you know, this is the main way that they have been spread throughout the world and become endemic in this world. Here's my new joke, sorry. Perfected by uh, the supply chain. Um, anybody get the, the joke in the back here, too? Anybody have, ever have a bug? The folding deck. Now, here's another big factor to think about when thinking about life cycle. Winter. We likes winter, and a lot of times winter is not the, the most helpful thing for bees, but it's pretty helpful when it comes to hive beetles because they stop reproducing when it gets cold. So one thing that we have here, a benefit that we have here in Pennsylvania is that we have winter. So that actually mm -mm, stopped this whole process. But if you live in the south, hive beetles reproduce all year long. We at least get a break. So let's look at the anatomy a little bit. The adults, they're not real big, about a half centimeter in length. They are brown to black. I already kind of showed you some pictures. And one thing that really can tip you off to know that you have a hive beetle, because there are other beetles that will get into your hive and other bugs that might kind of look like them that are, that are benign, they're not hive beetles but you'll see the club-shaped antenna, right? And I'll point that out to you guys in, in a picture. It's come back here, you can see it. And when it's first picked, it was club-shaped antenna. You really <coughs> puts you off that's what you got. But <coughs> I'll show you a few other pictures coming up. Uh, in the background here, you can see those are all larvae that are just infested in them. The eggs are very small. They may be very hard to see. They're actually smaller than um, honeybee eggs. Um, but sometimes the females will lay them in clusters around the hive that might make them a little easier to visualize. So if you see something like that. And they can lay them in the comb, but they can also kind of lay them out in different corners of the, the hive box as well. 
The larvae are actually bigger. They're probably the easier things to see because they don't move very fast. And they're about twice as big, about a centimeter long, compared to a half centimeter for the adult. And they kind of have this creamy white, typical larva appearance to them. The larvae are really the big problem when it comes to destruction in the hive because they are the ones that stay there in their developmental process and they eat everything. They will eat honey. They will eat brood. They will destroy the comb. They will defecate all over the comb. They will make the honey ferment and ruin your honey. So they're a big problem. They don't certainly stay there and, and can cause some damage themselves, but really the larva are the major component. So here's some larva. And you notice this is a little piece of pollen patty. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Here's the adult. Again, very classic look at this antenna. We're looking for that club shaped antenna to identify. They are pretty quick, they move pretty fast, they're really good at hiding. As soon as you open up a hive, they're going to take off. So they can sometimes be very hard to detect that you've only got a few of them in there, so the adults. Here's one reason why you sh I, I really think they shouldn't just be labeled as pests. And I know beekeepers do this, they, they label some parasites as pests, right? In veterinary medicine, we label parasites as diseases. We call them parasitic diseases, right? This is a parasitic disease that can be a vector for other diseases. This is when you should really pay attention. We all know what American Falcon is, and Bacillus larvae, the bacteria that's probably one of the worst diseases you can get if you're a beekeeper, right? These hive beetles in the literature apparently can be a vector, meaning they can carry American Falcon. Also, other honeybee viruses, like the foreign wing virus and sac fruit, which should sound a whole lot to you like from robot, right? So, don't count these guys out as carrying other diseases, not just the damage they do themselves, but the potential vector for other diseases. They also can affect our bumblebee pollinators. And I know a lot of you guys also care about our native pollinators. So, um, you know that hot beetles can affect them as well. All right, here's a little epidemiology. Anybody know what epidemiology is? Yes, the study of disease. You can actually be an epidemiologist. Sometimes, and I don't know, does this happen to beekeepers? Like, if you, because bees are so popular now, right? Everybody loves bees. And if someone finds out you're a beekeeper, do they like ask you a zillion questions? Do you guys get that a lot? Always. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? If, if you're a veterinarian, you get that too. You go to a party. Like, I try not to tell people I'm a veterinarian because then I know everything. About, and it's not that I don't like their... Yeah, Linda. It's, it's not that I don't like dogs and cats and everybody else, but, like, maybe it's my day off and I just don't want to talk about it. So, um, it, it's funny. Whenever I go to a party, I'll tell people I'm an epidemiologist. And then they go, oh, that's nice. And then they... Then we can talk about something else, <laughs> right? Because nobody knows. See, so you know. But it's, um, yeah, in veterinary medicine, in a lot of medicine, in a lot of biology, epidemiology is very important when you're studying diseases. It's, it's a practical way to really look at really kind of the numbers objectively of disease. And you have to think about, okay, anytime you have a disease that you're thinking about, What's going on with the host? And here I'm going to use parasites. I mean, you could put virus, bacteria, whatever infectious agent you're talking about. Environment. It's always, those are always your components. What's going on with your bees? What's going on with the infectious agent? What's going on with the environment? All three of those things are things we have to consider if we're going to try to control this. In epidemiology, they kind of call this the triad, the triangle. So, IPM, you guys know what IPM is, right? Integrated Test Manager. That's kind of the terminology that people bring up on from the We have to think of not just, okay, I'm going to squash this hive beetle. Well, great. But what else are you going to do? What are you going to do with the health of your bees? Do you 
nutrition of your bees, the environment that they're in, the biosecurity of your bee yard. Are you looking to those things to try to control what's going on? So here's a veterinary perspective of how we approach all diseases. All right, so here's, here's my bias, but it is how I was trained to scientifically kind of look at things. When I walk into a bee yard, if I walk into a, a, a cow yard, chicken, whatever, doesn't matter. It's the same approach every time. What's going on? What's the history? Why, why is there a problem? What do we know? Are there other previous stressors on your hives? If you don't know what stressors are on your hives, go make a list. Think of the things that your hives are dealing with today, yesterday, last season. Think of all the things they have to deal with and how you are maybe limiting those if you can. If you can. So punch can, so punch can. Travel history, and I mean travel history, where do bees come from? Did you bring them up from Georgia? Or are you making splits and you're in stock? It's controversial, I know, but it's very important by security where things come from. A term we use in uh, veterinary medicine when we're talking about any kind of animal, maybe a cow, you can get a farmer and says, ah, she's just a poor doer. It's probably not good English, right? But she's just a poor doer. I mean, she's just not doing well. I bet you guys know or have seen a hive that's a poor doer. That's just weak, right? And maybe you can't even put your finger on why. It just doesn't have to stop. Poor doers don't do well. A lot of times we eliminate them from the herd. Because not only are they not going to do well themselves, but they may infect the rest of the herd and the rest of the community. Few hive inspections performed in the past. Do you know what's going on in your hives? It's really hard to know if you have hive beetles if you don't look. And, and this is one thing, sorry to get preachy on you, but I, I, a lot of beekeepers may not know what's going on. Some of you guys are great at it, but if you're not doing routine inspections, you don't have a clue. Okay? If you just put the box in the back and let nature take its course, oh, nature will take its course, all right. She's rough. And then finally, absconding hives. Does the hives abscond? Did your bees leave? Not the hives. The hives leave. But the bees leave. Scud from the hives, I should say. They might know something you didn't. They left for a reason. And absconding uh, bees from a hive is an indication that something's going on there. One of them, one of the differentials on the list, is hive. So make sure you're doing routine inspections. Now not today, because it's cold, it was November, and you should put them away and talk to them in the winter at this point, right? That's a whole other time. This is actually out in Montana. Somewhere in Montana. <laughs> I was working with some uh, commercial beekeepers out there. You should know whether your bees are healthy or not. This is actually a frame. Amari Grave, eight year uh, Grove City in the springtime, where they were just building some pillars, bringing in some nectar and some pollen. Know what's going on. So after you kind of get a history of what's going on, what's happening in your yard, then we do our exam again. Now, at that time, looking. With hive beetles, you can see adults. They're quick, you can see them. Larva, yeah. You see larva, you know you have reproduction taking place in that hive, and they're pretty easy to see. Eggs are a little more difficult to see, like I said, because they're smaller, but they can still be seen. And sometimes, if you have a really strong hive, they'll actually make little beetle jails out of propolis and kind of put them in an area and they'll all be kind of stuck up and make their own kind of beetle trap. Or you'll see damaged comb. 
damage cone from the larva, from the adults, slime trails that go through, fermenting honey, smell it. Notice I have exam and diagnosis. How can we diagnose it? Well, you can place hive traps. Hive traps, and I'll talk a little bit more about them as we go through, but hive traps can serve as a treatment to get rid of some hive beetles, but they can also diagnose and confirm that they're there. Okay. Uh, some of the literature will talk about checking for the pupa in the soil in front of the hive. I think that might be a, a bit of a, a fishing trip but uh, apparently it can be done. Uh, once you find the adults or the larva, though, um, you can you capture them, you can take a look at them. It's better even to look at them under a microscope. You can actually see the, uh, the club-shaped antenna really well. And you can send these out to, to labs, and they'll actually confirm it. Um, entomologists can take a look at it. The lab can take a look at it. And there's even a PCR test, if you, know, if you have money that you want to burn, um, <laughs> that'll uh, confirm that that's what they are. So these are high beetles all through here. And I put a, uh, I'm not making any endorsement here, but um, there's all different types of traps out there on the market at some different times. Um, here's a decent website that shows you all different types of varieties. Geekstreetclub.com, um, high beetle traps. So again, we do history, we do an exam, we try to diagnose what's going on, and we've got to treat it once we've got our diagnosis. There's certainly chemicals out there that you can use. All of the chemicals that you use to treat hive beetles are also toxic to your bees. They're also toxic to you. They're also toxic to the environment. They're also very persistent. They also have a lot of resistance in hive beetles. So you can use them. And then actually, the article that I, I've written for bee culture, I talk about it a little bit because it's out there, but I wouldn't recommend it. Humifos is actually a, a chemical that you literally put into the hive in strips. And then pyrethrins, that's a group of drugs that we've used in veterinary medicine for uh, a long period of time uh, in a variety of different drugs and antiparasitical drugs. Uh, and certainly, um, it can be helpful in certain cases for certain parasites. Um, and you can buy it for hive beetles in a ground drench that you don't put in the hive, but you put in front of the hive, kind of target the pupa and the larvae that are coming down. Of the two, pyrethrins are probably the better than cumophos. Cumophos is organophosphate. Um, and again, I can remember learning about this drug, this chemical, but I learned about it as a toxin in veterinary school, not as a treatment. So, uh, my reference, you know, what I would rather have you guys do is take more of an IPM approach. Again, focus on what can you do with your bees? What can you do with the parasite? What can you do with the environment? It's going to be the better balance. All kinds of hive traps out there. You can buy them commercially. You can make your own. Um, you can use those towels. Sometimes you can put oil in the trap to help uh, catch the beetles or not. But one thing, and, and I think Cece, I remember you posted something about this. Just like sweeper cloth, like swippers, okay, in the hive, put them in the corners of the hive, that can kind of catch them up. And they're not going to catch too many bees, being smarter than the beetles, apparently. But that'll catch some of them and it can creep an eye. And any beetle that you see, kill that thing. Okay, anything you can take out? What I'd really like you to do is focus more on prevention as a treatment. Control humidity. These guys will not, will not reproduce in humidities that are less than 50%. So if you have a real wet hive, and I know there's all different types of belief systems out there, but I mean, I, I keep I keep an open entrance, uh, or an open top entrance all winter long. I like airflow through my eyes. Some of you guys like open uh, bottom board, screen bottom board. Yeah. Around here, I kind of, I like a solid bottom board, but you know, we can 
that's another problem <coughs> that he's got. But I do think you need to make sure you got airflow through your hive and control that, that humidity. Winter is your friend, something to be happy about. That stops the life cycle. Okay, so you're not going to have hive beetles reproducing at this time of the year, and that's great. You can take advantage of that. I'm sure you guys have heard about this a lot. Strong colonies, strong colonies, keep strong colonies. Yeah, keep strong colonies. If you have strong colonies, they'll take care of a lot of bees. It's not that a strong colony can't be infected with a hive beetle, but they'll deal with it a lot better. And with your help, you can at least control this endemic pest. <coughs> stronger colony, they have a stronger hive beetle. You can put your sweeper cloths in or traps or whatever you're going to use in now for the winter because if there's anything in there, meaning that female that's overwintering with your cluster, maybe you can catch her up by springtime. And all she's doing is sitting in there right now. And if you catch all the females that might be in there over winter, they're not going to be able to reproduce in the spring. you got to lay up. And you'll know if they're there or not. If you pull your super cloth out in the spring, there's nothing in there. Or your trap, or everything. Ain't good. Don't ignore them. Again, I've had too many beekeepers. They're just like, ah, it's a high beetle. Maybe you should pay attention. Uh, DE. Anybody know what DE stands for? Diatomaceous earth. earth. Yeah, diatomaceous earth is a uh, little. Uh, prehistoric beings called diatoms and their little skeletons that are left over. Um, I remember uh, using DE for swimming pools. You put it in swimming pool filters. Right? But the idea is with DE is that you can sprinkle it in front of the hive and the little shells, it's, it, it cuts the larva and the pupa so that they don't make it or they don't live. I, uh, I put a question mark after that because it's sort of anecdotal in the literature whether this stuff works or not. Um, but it's something you can try. I really think, and this is what I do, don't put your hives directly on the dirt. Because they need the dirt in that pupal stage to go down and pupate. Put some plastic down, put a weed barrier, put some gravel, Put your hive. You just stop the life cycle. And now you don't have to annoyingly mow around your hives. Biosecurity in your yard. <coughs> Where you're getting your bees from. If you're bringing them up from a southern region, and someone's going to shoot you for saying this, but if you're bringing them up from a southern region, you're, they're going to have hive bees. Much more likely. Make sure you can inspect your nukes if you're bringing them up or your packages. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a concern. I've made it, you know, some people mad. But it's, but it's biosecurity. Biosecurity is something that, you know, really with beekeepers, you've got to pay attention to that. Like what's coming into your world, you know, you're bringing that into your yard, into your bees. And there's things that you can do to slow that down. It's not perfect, but there's certainly things you can do to slow that down. And in the spring, you know, make splits. How many bees you got to have, right? If you overwinter your bees, you got strong colonies, you're going to have more bees coming out your eyeballs in the springtime, all right? Um, I'm afraid this spring. Um, so, biosecurity, biosecurity. Be careful what you bring. Process your honey quickly. Now, uh, when you bring honey into your honey house, your garage, or whatever your system is, uh, that actually attracts high bees. So if you bring it in and let it sit there, you're going to attract hive beetles to your area. So if you process it quickly, you're less likely to bring them into your area. And then freezing your frames. If you have the ability to freeze your frames, that actually will kill off um, any type of egg or larva, and not just hive beetles, but a lot of other parasites and infected agents. Pollen patties. Can you guys use pollen patties? Maybe the spring. And it's okay, I'm not going to, you know, poo them. There's certainly a purpose for them. But they do, the larvae um, are often, the eggs, excuse me, are often laid by the female. 
it's a good food source for them. So it does attract females to lay their eggs in the pollen patty, and a lot of times that's where you'll see your larvae. There's some beehives on gravel. They're not going to be able to keep taking. So you're going to stop that like this. So I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but there's always a new disease on the horizon, right? A new issue. Uh, and there is something called a large high fuel, which is Oplostomus, I believe, uh, in the genus, Fuligineus uh, and Heraldine. Some guy named Harold must be named this one. <laughs> now, these guys, I believe, are also native to Africa. They're not here yet. Yes. But they're on our watch list. And by the way, here's something beekeepers have done lately that you guys should kind of tout. Bees have made the USDA watch list. And there used to not be a lot of bee diseases on the USDA list. It was devoted to cattle and chickens and pigs and things like that. But now, and here's the website for that. You can actually go on and see what diseases are at least voluntarily reportable in the U.S. that the USDA is at least watching for. So that's a little bit more attention than what you guys used to get, which is actually nice. You should use that for your, for your benefit. But, um, Hive beetles, large hive beetles are on that list. So I got some references. You know, if any of you guys, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to share this with your club. So I just kind of want to end up with, you know, what do you guys do? I mean, I'm sure some of you guys have encountered hive beetles, and maybe you have your own methods that, that kind of work out for you. Um, any secrets that you have. I mean, what I've done is, you know, yeah, I, I talk now, a lot of people ask me to, but I, I got to that point because I listen a lot, and I, and I still like to listen to see what, what you guys are doing. Collectively in this room, there's a few years of knowledge, huh? decades. So, anybody have any input on what you do for hot beetles? Anything that works for you, or anything that you've seen? Any stories you want to tell? Well, if uh, hive beetles are coming after the hives, you know, a lot of people talk about the nematodes, for example, for the soil, dealing with them. Uh, because they also observed the larvae when they left the hives and found them to travel up to 100 yards mm -hmm. from the hives, so they creep along. So the gravel underneath uh, helps immediately adjacent to that area. But so then the attack is, or the defense is, to have an entrance on the hive that frustrates the adult hive beetles to have an inability to hover. They land on the landing board, then they go in. So if they have a leading edge that stands proud at the front of the hive, then that beetle spends a lot of time circling that. And again, so then the second approach is once they're inside, <coughs> providing beetle jails or things like that. And the upper far reaches where they tend to get pushed back by the bees. And then of course, baiting those. And as you said, use those as indicators that you have a presence of the small hive beetle adults. And of course, we know they fly over miles, as you already said, and so they can smell a hive. And also about the pollen patties, and you know, they're in surplus in the hive, they're not being attended to by the yeah. bees. Yeah. So I guess, so defending them from getting in, dealing with them once they're in, and then the larvae once they're out with the nematodes and things like that. Because the nematodes actually actively seek out the larvae and continue to hunt them, so it's a really good in soil. Yeah. Yeah, I read a little bit about the nematodes. I didn't know too much about them, but I, I, uh, yeah. that's, that's kind of an interesting IPM method. Yeah. Anybody else? I didn't notice of any of them up until literally this September in my house. All of a sudden, they're there. And I got some traps and I put them in. Now I took the traps out for the winter because I didn't think I should have them in the winter. 
So you're saying they could be left in the winter? <clears throat> yeah, I'd leave them in. Okay. Because if you have if you have some females that are overwintering, maybe you're going to catch them up, and you'll know if you got them or not. You know, in the spring when you open up your eyes for the first time. And as long oh, you, yeah. know, you put it kind of in the put it in the corners, so you're not going to. I have two deep to the super. Mm -hmm. Does put traps in each one of those or? If well, I mean, you, you can you can put them in the the corners of each one. Especially if you, do you know where your bees are now, are they down lower? They're going to move on up. You know, they're going to, that high beetle might move with the cluster somewhere. I mean, I wouldn't fill up your whole hive with, with uh, swippers, but, you know, putting a few in, giving the opportunity, you're going to increase the ability to, to, to nail them, you know, and, and be able to get them out of the, hopefully, population. Without interfering well, with the bees. Bees also tend to have the chimney effect during the winter. So, do the beetles also kind of stay to the center? They do stay they towards the cluster. Out? They do stay towards the cluster, but in the winter, but they also kind of get chased out by the bees a lot of times. So, they may hide out in the corners, particularly if you have winters like ours where the cluster kind of goes like this, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, our bees don't stay in cluster all winter long because we have actually relatively mild winters compared to other places. You know, we have 40, 50 degree days a lot of times in January. So yeah, they'll be running around a little bit more. You might get Yeah, most people are astonished that bees are alive and fly and during the winter sure. and all that other stuff. Sure do. Yeah, if you get a cleansing flight, maybe they'll shove their your hive beetle into the swiffer cloth. Yeah. I do have a question about the winter and the, uh, the beetle itself. Yeah. Um, does Freezing cold actually kill the adult beetle. You know it does the eggs and larvae. It, it will. It will if they're by themselves. But if they can, you know, be in a hive and you know, take advantage of the heat. Do you the know bees. what the minimum survival temperature is for them? I don't know where they stop producing. And I, actually, I was looking for this. I mean, just overwintering. Yeah, I, I think you know anything below freezing, they're not going to do anything at all. But I don't, I don't know what the minimum temperature is. But they'll actually die. I know off the top of it. Yeah, I couldn't find that. I actually looked for that. Yeah, it's a good question. Do any of the mite treatments affect the beetles? Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what mite treatment are you talking about? I guess would be the question what do you do? Okay. Yeah, there's so many different mite treatments out there. Um, I haven't, in the literature, I'll tell you, the short answer to that in the literature, I haven't seen that that was really, you know, a yes. Okay. Um, this, no, you know, if you use an insecticide in your beetle. hive, is it going to have some effect on the hive beetle? This falls under the beekeeper. If there's seven beekeepers, you'll get 11 different answers. So we can do it. Yep. Yeah, I, I've been around long enough to. We treat you know, for varroa thermally. Yeah. It doesn't work yeah. large scale, but we've yeah. got five colonies. It's real labor intensive. Yeah. We started four years ago. Since then, we haven't seen a high. I, I feel that. Yeah. That's interesting. I don't. Do you know if there's any studies on that at all? I don't. Beetles? It's just anecdotal. Our experience is we had high beetles before. We <coughs> That's actually a really good idea. That's that's easy to prove. I'm sorry. That's easy to prove. Right. Those that are having hive beetles, because I'm with you, I have no hive beetles at all. But I also don't thermal treat, so we can't say because they're absent. This is the reason. Yeah. But one of the things we can do is those who do have the hive beetles, <coughs> especially the lower elevation beekeepers, like up in Wattsburg, we don't have them. Down in Harbor Creek, for example, I put a satellite hive out there and picked up hive beetles right away. So you want to get some of those people that collect hive beetles. You want to trap them. And then you want to include them. And one of your hives is going to get a thermal treatment. And then you want to see if those hive beetles survive that thermal treatment. And you'll have your answer right there. We should talk to Penn State. I mean, that's, that's yeah. a, that would be a fantastic. It's easy to do. Put them in harm's way and see what the result is. <laughs> Unless you don't want to kill the hive beetles. <laughs> I mean, that, that's awesome. That's a paper right there. <coughs> Great idea. Well, the 
few of them. Mitocytes, though, they're mitocytes. True. Beetles are insects. Correct. So, Correct. you know, things are specific. Yeah. Mitocytes are not going to kill insects. They are more, they are more specific, and, you know, mites are arachnoids, right? So they're, they're related to spiders, um, you know, beetles. That the diversity within, you know, what we think of as bugs is, is pretty broad. Um, so yeah, I I haven't read anything in the literature out there as to whether you know, Apivar or any other treatment, cellic acid, you know, whatever, has any effect on high people. But I I don't know that it doesn't. But I haven't read anything. But Lynn's right. It's not it's not a specific treatment. So you treat, we, we treat things that are like ticks. Growers are like ticks, and ticks yes. are hard to kill. So they are. It's not like trying to kill things. Correct. Yep. Anything else? Question is, hanging your frames, for instance, I hang my frames in an outdoor shed in the winter. In this part of the country, is that sufficient? To kill is that a sufficient freeze? No, because it doesn't stay cold enough. Long enough. Long enough. Okay. And you're going to have these warm spells. I mean, there's some days we get 60 degree days in January. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I would I would freeze them, like in a in a freezer if you can. For I what mean, period? A cold time? shed is better than nothing. But a lot of times, if you leave your hives uh, frames drawn comb out in just the shed, you're going to have issues, and, th and then you're going to wax moths and everything else too. For what period of time do they need to be frozen? Until you're going to put them back in the hive. Oh, okay. Because you bring them, you bring them back out into, you know, outside of the weather. And sure. Warm enough, and sure. You know, they're susceptible again. Yeah. And that's you know that's not always practical for depending on the size of your operation. I understand, but it can work for a, a backyard beekeeper. Sure, we only you have to get it old. <laughs> You know, just freezer that you can devote to that process. Yeah. Not really. I haven't used it. Um, I mean. Get those 
parasites back in your environment, yeah, you could have issues. Any other input once you guys do? No, it's been an hour, so yeah, it's let's time. move on. <laughs> Way to get kicked off. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.